today we are going to talk about the concept of vector spaces. And basically we'll start with our linear combinations of vectors, we'll generalize them, and we'll get something that we'll refer to as vector spaces. Then we'll give quite a number of examples, show how the computations go, and finally a takeaway from today's lecture. So let's start. The motivation for doing this is there's a great number of mathematical objects that all obey the rules of linear combinations. So for example, if you think about functions, so look at this function here, f of x is equal to 5 plus 3 sine x plus 2 cosine x, and realize that if we make the following definitions, if we let f1 of x be 1, f2 of x equal to x, and f3 of x equal to cosine x, then what we have written is f of x is equal to 5 times f1 plus 3 times f2 plus 2 times f3. A linear combination of these three functions forms a new function over here. So what we want to do is we want to generalize the notion of vectors so that any objects that we can write linear combinations with are going to be captured by that notion. So the basic ingredients are a set of vectors, whatever they happen to be, the scalars that we multiply those vectors by in our linear combinations, so we'll use R, even though most of our examples typically include the rational numbers instead, and yes, we could use other number systems, like for example, complex numbers, but we won't go there. And finally, the addition operation and the scalar multiplication operation, so indeed we can write these vector spaces. And what we want to do is we want to have rules so that we can manipulate linear combinations exactly the same way that we do with vectors in Rn. So that leads us to the following definition of a vector space. First of all, the ingredients. A set of vectors, whatever they happen to be. A set of scalars, here we'll choose R. The addition operation for vectors, so if I take a vector plus another vector and add them together, I get a vector. And the scalar multiplication operation, if I take a scalar in R and another vector and I multiply them together, I get a vector. So I have these four ingredients. And now the rules for operating on these vectors with these functions, with addition and scalar multiplication, they're modeled on what we had for regular vectors. In fact, this was a theorem for regular vectors that we saw at the very beginning of this course. So if I take any three vectors, u, v, and w in my set of vectors, any two scalars, alpha and beta in R, then I want the following rules to hold, the following axioms. Axiom number one, if I add two vectors, u and v, or if I add them v and u, the order doesn't matter, I get the same result. So u plus v is equal to v plus u. The next operation says that if I take v and w on the left there, and I add them, I get a new vector, and then I add u to this new vector, the result is exactly the same as if I first added u and v to get a new vector, and then added the result to w. So I don't really need to write those parentheses and I don't need to really be stringent about the order. This lets me reorder the computation, so I could equally well have computed u plus w and then added v to it. I can therefore simply write u plus v plus w and do the computation any which way that I care to. The next operation, well, here's this inverted e is mathematical notation for there is such an element and this epsilon-like shape in my set of vectors v. So what this says is there is some element which we'll call the zero vector inside my collection of vectors. And the property of that zero vector is that if I take a vector u and I add the zero vector to it, the result is no change. u plus the zero vector is equal to u. Then for any one u there's also another element which is typically called the additive inverse, u tilde. And u tilde has the property that if I add u to u tilde, I get the zero vector. Now, those are the properties of addition. Now let's add scalar multiplication to the mix, so we have four more properties. The first one says that if I take a scalar and I multiply it into the sum u plus v, 
I can equally well simply scale u by that scalar, scale v by that scalar, and then add the resulting vectors, and I'll get the same result on both sides. So the scalar alpha distributes over the sum of vectors, over that plus sign. Similarly, the scalar operation, if I take a scalar alpha and a scalar beta and I add them together to get a new scalar, and then I scale u with that new scalar, I can equally well get this by taking alpha times u by scaling u by alpha, beta times u, scaling u by beta, and take those two resulting vectors and add them. So what that means is that u, the vector, distributes over the addition of scalars. So either way, I can simply multiply this out the way I expect from my vector operations, from regular vector operations. And the other point to make here is that the parentheses on the right aren't really necessary. I can simply write this as alpha u plus beta u without any ambiguity. The same kind of property holds for multiplication of scalars. So if I take u, scale it by beta, take the resulting vector and scale it by alpha, I could equally well simply have computed the product of alpha and beta of those two scalars, and then scaled u by that product. Again, I don't need the parentheses at all since the result is unambiguous. And finally, I need 1 times u, the scalar 1, multiplied times u, equal to u. Now, one comment here is that that set of vectors v that I've just used to form this vector space by adding the scalars and all these operations and properties of the operations, typically we know from context what the scalars are, and we know from context what the addition operation is and what the scalar multiplication operation is. So when it's known from the context, when I don't have any problem figuring out what is actually meant, we'll just write the collection of vectors v and say we have a vector space v. Another point to make is that it looks like some properties are missing from that list of axioms. And the reason is that I can actually get them by manipulating those axioms. And so here is a theorem to complete this, namely the first theorem, that zero vector in number three, that zero vector is unique. There's only one such. And there's an easy way of getting it. The zero vector, if I take any one vector in V and multiply it by the scalar zero, I get the zero vector. Similarly, in rule number four, the additive inverse that U tilde, that's also unique. And there's also an easy way to get it. For any one v, any one vector, I simply take that vector and multiply it by the scalar minus 1. And the result is this additive inverse. Notice that there are three scalars that are important here. Scalar 1, 1 times u is equal to u. Scalar 0, 0 times v is the 0 vector. And the scalar minus 1, minus 1 times v is the additive inverse of v. The notation right now looks a little bit clumsy, so we'll simplify it. Here, for the additive inverse, v tilde is equal to minus 1 times v, we'll simply write minus v. Similarly, I can write u plus minus 1 times v. Again, we'll simplify that to write u minus v. And so what we get out of the whole thing is, yeah, we have addition defined, but now we've also defined the difference between two vectors. It's just u plus the additive inverse of v. The last piece that seems to be missing is that there is an interplay between equality and addition and scalar multiplication. Namely, if I take u equal to v, then if I pick any other vector and add it in on both sides, u plus some vector w and v plus some vector w, that equality is maintained then I can go back and forth between those two. So from u plus w is equal to v plus w, I can simply conclude that u is equal to v. Similarly, for scalar multiplication, and the only reason I say that alpha has to be different from zero in this definition here, is that what I want is I want to be able to go back. So if I have alpha u is equal to alpha v, I want to cancel out the alpha and the only way I can do that is if I make alpha different from zero. 
If I think about multiplying zero, the scalar zero, into u equals v, I'll get the zero vector equal to zero vector, which doesn't give me any information, so there's no problem in this restriction. The end result is that the algebra of linear combinations for arbitrary vectors works exactly the same as scalar algebra. So let me give you an example. I'll start with some vector space v, and I'll pick three vectors in it, u, v, and x, and I'll have this expression here, this equality between vectors, that 3x plus 2u minus v happens to be equal to 5x minus u plus v, and I'd like to solve for x. So what I'll do is I'll put all the x's on one side and all the u's and the v's on the other side. And the way I can do this is by simply using this last property here of for the equality, I can, for example, to get the, all the x's on one side, I can add minus 5x on both sides. 5x minus 5x will cancel on the right, and I'm left with 3x minus 5x on the left, and I'll do the same thing for the u's and v's to push them over to this side. And this is the expression I end up with. So these are the properties of equality and vector addition. Now what I'll do is I'll use my axioms. So 3x minus 5x, I know that's the same thing as 3 minus 5 times x, and 3 minus 5 is minus 2. So it's the same thing as minus 2 times x. So the left here is minus 2 times x. I'll do the same thing on the right-hand side to get to this expression. And the very last step to do is to simply multiply that equality by 1 over minus 2, so as to scale out that minus 2 factor leaving me with x is equal to 3 or 2u minus v. So I've solved for x, and as you see, it's exactly the kind of algebra that you've seen all along in your schooling to date. One other thing to notice here is I didn't tell you what my vectors were. So I could have them be regular vectors. For example, x, u, and v are vectors in R3. Or my motivating examples say that I have vectors that happen to be functions. I could equally well have u, v, and x be functions, and the exact same operations will hold, will go through. So let's look at some examples of vector spaces and see what we can find. In fact, it will lead to a few further definitions and theorems. Let's start by just looking at vectors in Rn. Vectors in Rn, well, the vector space operations are modeled after how vectors in Rn behave. Those were a theorem in the beginning. So, not unsurprisingly, Rn is indeed a vector space. So, no problem there. The next example is going to be the smallest vector space that we can get. And by small, I mean it has a single element in it. It just has the zero vector in it. So the example here uses the zero vector in R3, namely the origin, 0, 0, 0. And so my set of vectors is just the origin all by itself. And if you check, all of the rules of a vector space are indeed satisfied, so that this is the smallest vector space that I can find inside of R3, just as a single element. One other thing to notice here is that we've just found a vector space the vector space that just contains the origin, inside of the vector space R3. So a vector space inside of a vector space. For my next example, a span of vectors, and here I have two vectors. V1 is 3 minus 1, 1. V2 is 1 minus 1, 1. Two vectors in R3. And if you remember, the span of two vectors in R3 gives me a plane. So I have a plane and I claim that that plane satisfies all of the axioms of a vector space. And the easiest way to see that is to simply write down the definition of the vector space. My plane is the set of all vectors v that I can get by forming all possible linear combinations of v1 and v2. So alpha v1 plus beta v2 for any alpha and beta in R. And at this point, I'd like you to think about how this can be made to satisfy all of the properties that we have for vector spaces. So I'd like to encourage you to pause the video at this point and to simply go back to the definition and see if you can make this fit. So take a moment and let's come back. Okay, so now that you're back, you may have noticed that 
there was something important that you had to check, namely that if I take any two vectors, v1 and v2, inside my vector space, so any two vectors in my plane, their sum must also be in the vector space. The sum of two vectors in the plane must be in the plane. Similarly, scalar product, if I take any one vector in my vector space and any one scalar, that scalar product must be in V. So if I take any one vector in my plane and I multiply it by some scalar, the result is indeed a vector in the plane. That turned out to be crucial. The rest, all of the axioms, well, if my vectors happen to be in R3 to begin with, and R3 is a vector space, then for the vectors in the plane, they are in R3. So they inherit all of the properties of a vector space in this smaller space in that plane. I can rephrase all of this. I can say that these two rules then add up to the following, that if I form any linear combination of vectors inside my vector space, the result is a vector inside of my vector space. So no matter what vectors I pick, no matter what linear combination of these vectors I form, I can't escape from my vector space. I'm always going to be inside V. Or for the example of the plane, if I take any vectors in the plane and form all possible linear combinations of vectors in the plane, I'm not going to get out of that plane. I'm going to stay in that plane. One other thing, that plane lives in R3. All of the vectors in it, for example, the zero vector has three entries, not two. The way you might think, if I simply said, well, give me a vector in a plane, you might give me a vector with two entries. But that's not necessarily true. The question is, what space am I actually in? If I'm in R3, my vectors have three enters in them, even though they specify, say, all of the points in the xy plane. Now, that leads me to add a little bit to our language. So let S be some set of vectors in a vector space. And what we have just seen is if I take two vectors in that space, I want their sum to also be in that space. If that's true for any vectors, then I say that that space is closed under addition. So what closed under addition means is simply any sum of vectors in this set is still in the set. Similarly for scalar multiplication. Pick any one vector in the set, scale it by any one constant, the result is still in the set. So closed under addition closed under scalar multiplication. And immediately a theorem that goes with that, namely the span of vectors. If I take some vectors, S1, S2, Sk, and say that's a set of vectors inside some vector space V, if I look at the span of these vectors, the result is a vector space inside of V. So our example was the span of two vectors forming a plane as a vector space inside of R3. Now, this definition and this theorem apply to any vector space, not just to R3 or not just to Rn, but our motivating examples functions would also hold. Let's look at other vector spaces. So the next set of examples here involve matrices. So here's my definition. A set is composed of things A, where A is a matrix of size 2 by 3. The notation for it is a script M, and the subscript 2 by 3 simply says the size of the matrices in M is 2 by 3. In terms of addition and scalar multiplication, they're closed, because I take a matrix of size 2 by 3, I add it to another matrix of size 2 by 3, I get a matrix of size 2 by 3. If I multiply matrix of size 2 by 3, again, the result is of size 2 by 3. And if you check the axioms, you'll find that all the other axioms hold, and therefore matrices of fixed size indeed form a vector space. In fact, any fixed size matrices of size m by n form a vector space. For my next example, I want to look at a subset of such matrices. So this time around, I'm in M three by three, so three by three matrices, but I'm going to place a restriction on those matrices. They have to be upper triangular. 
And again, if we check, upper triangular matrices are closed under addition. Take two upper triangular matrices, add them together, the zeros add to zero, and therefore the result is still an upper triangular matrix. Similarly with scalar multiplication, and again, everything works out. The set of upper triangular matrices of fixed size is a vector space. For my next examples, we'll look at vector spaces of functions. After all, we started with functions in the very beginning of this lecture. So the first vector space of functions that we'll look at is all possible functions on the interval minus infinity to plus infinity, written script f with the interval to the side of it. So in set notation, the set of all possible functions on an interval is f of x, where that function f is defined from the domain R to the codomain R. And when we check, we'll find that indeed that is a vector space with usual definitions of addition and scalar multiplication for functions. Now, why would that really be a vector space? How does that relate? And one way to think about it is as follows. If I take a vector in Rn, then for each index for that vector, I have a corresponding value for the entry of that vector. So for index i equals 1, for example, I have an entry v1. For index i equals 2, I have an entry v2. I actually have a function from the indices to the entries in the vector. A function just generalizes that notion. If I think of x in that f of x as the index, then for any one index, x, I have a corresponding value, f of x. To show it to you graphically, I've written a little bit of code, which we don't need to look at, but I want the output. So here, I've defined the function x squared plus 1. This is an element of my vector space of functions, and I've graphed it here over the interval from minus 5 to 5, actually. The other thing I've done here is I've pulled out a few x values. So for example, the function at x equals minus 3 happens to be 10. The function at my second index, minus 2, happens to be 5. The function at my third index, which is at x equals minus 1, turns out to be 2. And look, I skipped x equals 2 for my indices. I have first index, second index, third index, fourth index seven indices all together, and therefore I pulled out the special values 10, 5, 2, all the way to 17. So I have a vector that happens to be samples of that function, and that would be a vector in R7. And I have a vector that happens to be the function f of x is equal to x squared plus 1, a vector in my set of functions. Another example of functions that are vector spaces I get from polynomials. So here I want to look at the set of polynomials of degree less than or equal to 2 on the interval minus 1 to 1, including the endpoints. The notation is the script P, the subscript 2 is the degree of the polynomials less than or equal to 2, and minus 1, 1 says the x values are going to range from minus 1 to 1, square bracket says, endpoints are included. All functions that look like alpha plus beta x plus gamma x squared for any alpha, beta, and gamma. One thing to notice is that if I make a definition, if I say, hey, wait a second, p1 of x is just a constant 1, p2 of x is just x, and p3 of x is just x squared, then I can rewrite that definition as a span. It's just a span of the functions p1 of x, p2 of x, and p3 of x. And we already know from the theorem we quoted above that spans are vector spaces, a vector space inside of the vector space of functions. So again, let me show you a graph. So here, this time around, I pulled out the polynomial of degree 2, 1 minus 3x squared. And I plotted it here in blue, uh, going from x equals minus 1 to x is equal to plus 1. Then I ask for the additive inverse. Well, the additive inverse I get by multiplying my vector by minus 1. So minus 1 
plus 3x squared should be the additive inverse. So I plotted that vector, that function. I know that the vector plus its additive inverse adds up to the zero vector. So for example here, at x equals zero, the value of 1 minus 3x squared is 1, the value of minus 1 plus 3x squared at x equals 0 is minus 1, and they add up to 0. Now, what was the 0 vector? The 0 vector is take any one vector, like 1 minus 3x squared, and multiply it by 0. That yields 0. So the 0 vector is the function z of x equal to 0. In my plot here, that's just the x-axis in green. So the x-axis in this representation is the 0 vector for my set of polynomials. So again, to emphasize, I have a set of functions. I want to know what the zero vector is. I take any one function, so in this example, let's pick x, multiply that by zero. So now I have x times zero is equal to zero. And therefore, the vector, remember their functions, the vector z of x equal to zero is the zero vector. So the x-axis in this plot. The other thing I want to mention is the set notation that I've been using. So let's look at it in a little bit more detail. We have the name of the set on the left with an equal sign, and then we have curly braces, and the curly braces means a collection of objects. Next to that opening curly braces, right here, whatever is written in here, that's our vector. And then to the right, we are going to have a membership constraint, some rule that that vector has to satisfy in order to be in this collection. So as an example, this expression here, s is equal to o, x, y, those are my vectors, those are vectors in R2 as it happens, right? So yes, this set is in R2. And the membership constraint says I want something about x's and y's that has to be true, namely that the x is between minus 1 and 1, not including the boundaries, and the y must be greater or equal to 0. So, for example, the vector 0 minus 5 is not in here because minus 5 is not greater or equal to 0. This defines a set S. We know what the vectors are, we look here, and we know what constraints there are that these vectors have to satisfy to be inside of our set. We will now expand on our ideas of vector spaces by looking at the following. The first thing is we've seen vector spaces inside of vector spaces, and so we want to capture that notion. So here, if we start with a vector space, we're going to say that some set of vectors inside of that vector space, for example, that plane inside of R3, that that is a subspace of the vector space, if and only if the following conditions hold. First of all, the S's, of course, have to be inside of V, and that equality over here means that V itself will be a subspace of itself. The second condition is we don't want that set of vectors to be empty. So if we have membership constraints and they are so stringent that there's nothing inside of S, we don't have a subspace. So this notation here says that S is not the empty set, a set without any elements in it. And third, of course, that S is a vector space in its own right, and the scalars, vector addition, and scalar multiplication are whatever it inherits from the space that contains S. The remark I want to make is that a set is empty if it doesn't have any element in it. So if my collection is free of any element. If you look at this notation here, what this says is that I have a collection and it contains an element. It contains the origin. It contains the zero vector. This set is not empty. The other thing I'd like you to realize is that if you did the exercise I suggested above, and you went and tried to check if a subset of a vector space is indeed a vector space, you may have noticed that you didn't really have to check all of the axioms. Most of them you simply inherit from V. And as a consequence, we have a little theorem here, actually a big theorem, that enables checking very easily. We say that 
S is a subspace of some vector space V, if and only if the three conditions here are satisfied. Once I have those, I have all of them. So the first condition is simply that S is not empty. I have to have a set with vectors in it. The second condition is that this set must be closed under vector addition. So adding two vectors in S, I'm still in S. The third one is closed under scalar multiplication. Take a vector in S, scale it to by some factor, we're still in S. So it's often advantageous to actually replace condition one by checking for a particular vector. Namely, every vector space must contain the zero vector. Why? It's closed under scalar multiplication. So if I multiply a vector by zero, I get the zero vector. So the zero vector must be in S, and if the zero vector is in, then S is not empty. If I do that check first, it's usually very easy to do, that will exclude a heck of a lot of cases where the zero vector does not happen to be in my collection S. Some more remarks is that when I check whether or not something is a vector space, I need to make sure that all three conditions hold. So one must hold, two must hold, three must hold. If any one of them doesn't hold, I can stop the check right then and there and say, hey, wait a second, this S that I'm looking at is not a subspace. The other comment about checking whether or not something is a subspace is that we start with the conjecture that it is. So we start with S is a subspace. And when you check, for example, for closed standard vector addition, you can't just say, well, here's an example of two vectors in S that are inside, and I add them together and the result is inside. And the reason for that is that S tends to have an infinite number of vectors in it, and that condition must hold for all vectors, not just for this one example you pulled out. So you would have to write an infinite number of such checks, which of course we can't, so we'll have to be a little bit more clever than that. On the other hand, disproving a conjecture with a counterexample immediately shoots it down. I claim S is a subspace, and you say, hey, wait a second, here's an example that shows it's not closed under, let's say, a scalar multiplication. Here's a vector that's in S, and when I multiply it by 100 or whatever, it's no longer in S. That disproves my conjecture. And that technique is usually called proof by contradiction. Now, the template of a proof looks something like this. So wherever you see those angular brackets, you're going to write something inside of those angular brackets instead. So in your first step, you simply identify what the vectors are, and you identify what the membership constraint on those vectors has to be in order to say that that vector is inside my set. And then the next ingredient you want is you want to identify whatever the zero vector is for my set. So, for example, for functions, it's the function z of x equals zero. And once we have that, we proceed to step two. We are going to check each one of our conditions, one, two, and three, in whatever order we choose. Whatever order, because if you notice one of them doesn't hold, you would immediately be done. And if you notice a counterexample, you would immediately be done. So for the first check, what we have to write is the zero vector is whatever it happens to be. And then we have to check that zero vector. Is it or not in S? So we'll write that zero vector is in S or is not in S since it either does or doesn't satisfy the membership constraint. Substitute the zero vector inside your membership constraint and check whether it holds, yes or no. If no, you're done, and not a subspace. If we pass, then it's on to number two. And here the keyword is any, any vector in S. Right? So we have to write a parameterized version of a vector in S. So let S1 be any vector in S. And therefore we know that the membership constraint must hold for that vector. Right? So you write, let whatever expression be any vector in S, and therefore you immediately write what that means for that vector, similarly for S2. And then the question becomes, does the sum S1 plus S2 satisfy the membership constraint? 
So you compute S1 plus S2, and you substitute it in the membership constraint to check whether or not it holds. For scalar multiplication, the pattern is the same. Let S1 be any vector in S, and therefore this condition holds. Let alpha be any scalar. Does alpha times S satisfy that membership constraint? Turns out there's a shortcut. The moment you can rewrite S as a span, if you notice that you can rewrite it as a span, we know that a span is a subspace. We had the theorem, and so S is a span, therefore S is a subspace, and we're done. Let's go to some examples. The first example is vectors in Rn, and specifically, let's start with a span of vectors. So here, I've got my set S. It's made up of vectors called W, and the Ws look like this. Oh, one, two, three, three entries. That's a vector in R3. My vectors are vectors in R3, and they must satisfy the condition that they look like s plus t, s minus t, to s plus 3t, for whatever s and t I might want to substitute in this expression. Can we write it as a span? Well, let's see. Here, I can notice that I can split this vector into two, into a piece that contains s and a piece that contains t, a column view. So I can rewrite this as w is equal to s times the vector 1, 1, 2, plus t times the vector 1, minus 1, 3, for all s and t. But that's the definition of a span. So yes, s is the span of the vectors, the, the vector that multiplies s, the vector that multiplies t, and therefore s is the subspace of R3. How about another example? This one is very similar to the one I had before, namely S is the set of Ws such that W looks like this. The difference between this example and the previous one is I've got this plus one setting over here. And so when I try the same idea of writing it as a span, that plus one causes this extra vector, this constant vector sitting over here. So it no longer looks like a span, not a span. So we'll have to try our template instead. The zero vector, the moment we identify it, well, you take any one vector in here, for example, the vector 1, 0, 0 must be in, and then I choose S equals 0, T equals 0, right? It doesn't even have to be inside of S, it just has to be in R3. Multiply that by 0, and so we know the zero vector is just the origin, 0, 0, 0. So checking whether or not the origin is inside of S means checking whether or not w equals 0, 0, 0 can be written in this form for some parameter s and some parameter t. When I put that down in that fashion, I want to ask whether or not there's an s and a t, so that if I write s times this vector plus t times this vector plus the constant vector and set it equal to 0, that that's my w, uh, that that has to be satisfied, and I have to figure out, is there such an s and is there such a t? Well, if I rewrite this slightly, I see an AX equals B type of problem. A constant matrix times this unknown vector for entries S and T equal to a constant vector. And when I try and solve that, I find that it doesn't have a solution. Therefore, the zero vector is not in S. This is the easy case where the zero vector is not in, and therefore S cannot be a subspace of R3. For our next example, let's consider a set of vectors that is not a span, so something a little bit more involved. I'll do two examples at the same time since they have very similar figures. For my first example, S1 happens to be the set of vectors x, y, so we're in R2, such that the entries x times y multiply out to a number that's greater or equal to zero. And for the second set, x and y, has to have the y's greater or equal to zero, so no negative y's allowed. And here is the xy plane, and for example, in the first quadrant, the x's are positive, the y's are positive, and therefore x times y is indeed a positive number. In the second quadrant, x times y is negative, since x is positive, y is negative, the product is negative. Similarly, for quadrant three and four, and when you now look at S1, 
you want the areas where x times y is greater or equal to zero. So the first quadrant, any one vector in the first quadrant is in, any one vector in the third quadrant is in, and x times y equals zero is either x equals zero or y is equal to zero, is either the x-axis or the y-axis, and so the axis are inside of S1. For S2, it's the y value that can't be negative. Well, the y value is negative down below the x-axis, so S2 is anything above the x-axis, and since I allowed equality, the x-axis is also included in S2. So S2 is the upper half plane together with the x-axis. First, let's consider S1. For S1, we want the zero vector, and the zero vector is just zero, zero. It's the origin right here. And the origin is indeed in S1 since it satisfies the membership constraints. When you plug in here, x times y, zero times zero is indeed greater or equal to zero. So S1 is not empty. Next, we have to go to, let's go to number three, scalar multiplication. Right? If I pick a vector in S1, let's see, in, say I pick a vector in the first quadrant, this vector V1, or a vector along the axis U1 or U2, and I multiply it by a scalar. Well, positive numbers, I'll stay up above the axis or I'll stay on the axis. Negative numbers, I go from quadrant one to quadrant three or quadrant three to quadrant one. So that looks good. Let's check what this means algebraically. So if I take uh, my template and write, let x1, y1 be an element of s1. Notice I didn't say what x1 and y1 were, right? I made them parameters. But I know that that means the membership constraint is satisfied. So the product of those two entries must be greater or equal to zero. So that's what I write down. And let alpha 1 be any scalar, and now I have to look at what happens when I take alpha 1 times x1. So we have to consider this vector. Now, how about this vector? Is it in s1? Well, the membership constraint says I need to multiply the entries together, so alpha 1 x1 times alpha 1 y1, that multiplies out to alpha 1 squared x1 y1. We already know that x1 y1 is greater or equal to 0 because we started in s, we know that that constraint was satisfied. Alpha 1 squared is a non-negative number, and so no, we can't get any negative numbers out of it. The membership criterion is satisfied. That vector is in S1, and therefore S1 is closed under scalar multiplication. If we now go to number 3, again, our template is the same. It says let x1, y1 be an element of S1, and therefore the membership constraint is satisfied for it. Let x2, y2 be in S1, and therefore the membership criterion is satisfied for this vector as well. And the question is, what happens to the sum of those two vectors? So we have to write down the membership criterion for these two vectors, and when we do, when we multiply them out and try and figure this out, we see, hey, wait a second, x1, y1, we know, is greater or equal to zero. x2, y2 is greater or equal to zero. So this sum is greater or equal to zero but then I have these cross terms. And for the cross terms, all bets are off. That doesn't look like it's going to hold. So the question is, can we construct a counterexample? Algebraically, we can just try some x's and y's and make sure that the membership condition for the x's and y's is satisfied and then figure out something that adds up to a negative number over here. But it's probably easier to look back at our graph over here and to notice, hey, wait a second. If I take V1 in the first quadrant and V2 in the second quadrant, right? V1 is in S1, V2 is in S1. But if I sum those two vectors together, I'm in the fourth quadrant. I'll be outside of S1. Motivated by that, I know what I'm going to try. I'm going to look at this. Let V1 be the vector 2, 1 and v2 be the vector minus 1, minus 2, for example. So I pick v1 and v2 that look like the graph above, and then both of these vectors satisfy the membership constraints. Right? 2 times 1 is greater or equal to 0, minus 1 times minus 2 is 2 is greater or equal to 0. So they are indeed in S1. If I add them together, however, I get the vector 1 minus 1. That's in the fourth quadrant. 
multiplying out 1 times minus 1 gives me the negative number minus 1 that doesn't satisfy the membership constraint. So I have a counterexample, and therefore S1 is not closed under addition, and is therefore not a subspace of R2. If I look at S2, it's similar, although it's a little bit short. This time around, it's condition 3 that is violated. And if I look for a counterexample, suppose I take a vector u1 is equal to 0, 1. So on the y-axis in the upper half plane, the point 0, 1. If I multiply that by minus 1, I'm at the point 0, minus 1. I'm outside. If you look at it, I pulled 0, 1. I multiplied it by minus 1, so now I'm down here. I went from the upper half plane to the lower half plane. I started with a vector that was in S2, and I ended up with a vector that's no longer in S2, not closed under scalar multiplication, and therefore not a subspace of R2. Here's another example. This time I'll look at S, again, vectors in R2, and they satisfy this constraint. Now this constraint doesn't look like the planar constraint. And when you try and graph it, you see with equality, you see this ellipse. When x is equal to 4 and y is equal to 0, you indeed get equal to 1. So plus or minus 4 will work as the endpoints. Similarly for the y, when x is equal to 0, you get a plus 2 and minus 2. You see this ellipse over here. On the boundary of the ellipse, the equation is satisfied. It's indeed equal to 1. Inside the ellipse, well, if I plug 0 in here, a 0 plus 0 is indeed less than or equal to 1. So inside, my condition is satisfied. Outside, my condition is violated. And the intermediate value theorem tells us that to go from a negative value to a positive value, I have to pass through the 0 value, I have to pass through the red boundary. So I know inside of the ellipse, I'm in S. On the boundary of ellipse, since this was equal, I'm in S. And the moment I'm outside of that ellipse, I'm no longer in S. This doesn't look like a plane, so I should be able to construct an easy counterexample. Well, if I look at, say, some vector and I multiply it by a scalar, I'm changing its length, I can start with a vector that's inside my ellipse and move to a vector that's outside of my ellipse. Let's pull an example. For example, if I take v is equal to 2, 0, here, this vector, it's inside the ellipse, since it satisfies, plug in 2, 0 in my membership constraint, and yes, I see the membership constraint is satisfied, and then multiply that vector by a sufficiently large scalar. Say 5v gives me 10, 0, and 10, 0 is no longer inside the ellipse since the membership constraint is violated, and therefore S is not closed under scalar multiplication. S is not the subspace of R2, since we gave a counterexample. If we now look at matrices, I'll only pull out one example. Look at the set of matrices of size 2 by 2. I played a little game with my notation here. I put the membership what set A is inside of, right inside the definition of what my vectors are. So A happened to be matrices of size 2 by 2, and the constraint for membership is that the inverse of A exists. And this time around, the zero vector is not inside of M, because this matrix is not invertible. It violates the membership condition. Since C inverse doesn't exist, the zero vector is not inside my set, and therefore, this set is not the subspace of the matrices of size 2 by 2. So for our next examples, let's look at functions, sets of functions. First, we'll look at the following. The set of functions that has a second derivative that is continuous on the interval minus 1, 1. The notation here is C for continuous, 2 for the number of derivatives that have to be continuous, and the closed interval minus 1, 1 for the domain of our functions. So let's start off with the zero vector. The zero vector is just the function equal to zero for all the x's. Is this in here? Well, the membership condition says I have to look at the second derivative. Second derivative of zero is zero. 
And yes, the zero function is indeed a continuous function on the interval minus one, one. And so yes, the zero vector is inside my set. My set is not empty. For the second condition, you have to pull two arbitrary vectors inside my set. So I have to pull out a first function f1 that's in the set, and therefore its second derivative must be continuous. So f1 has a second derivative that is continuous on our interval. Similarly for f2, it has a second derivative that's continuous. And the question is, what happens to f1 plus f2? Let's compute its second derivative, since that's a membership constraint. So second derivative of f1 plus f2, a calculus theorem says that's just the sum of the second derivatives of the functions. And this one is continuous, that one is continuous, the sum of continuous functions is continuous. So yes, this is indeed a continuous function, and therefore my set is closed under addition. How about scalar multiplication? We pull a function f1 that's continuous, a second derivative is continuous, we pull a scalar alpha, in R, and we have to look at alpha 1 F1. Compute the second derivative. We know that's alpha 1 times the second derivative of F1. Continuous function times a constant is indeed continuous. And so yes, our set is also closed under scalar multiplication. And now I have condition 1, condition 2, and condition 3 that hold. So the last sentence I'll write is that since my conditions 1, 2, and 3 hold, this set is a subspace of the set of functions defined on the interval minus one, one. For my last example, I'll look at another set of functions. This time around, I want to look at the set S of functions equal to alpha plus 2x plus beta x squared for all possible alpha and beta. And if you look, that's again one of those examples where it's almost a span. But for a span, I would have to have an arbitrary parameter times x, not this constant. So when I try and write this out, the first thing I'll do is to say, well, the zero vector is zero, and I want to check whether or not z of x equals zero is in here. Well, z of x being in here means that z of x can be written as alpha plus 2x plus beta x squared, for some alpha beta for all of the x's in my domain. So I have to be able to write that alpha plus 2x plus beta x squared is equal to zero for some alpha and beta. So here, it's equal to zero, but it still has to hold for all the indices of my vector. It still has to hold for all possible x's. In particular, it has to hold for zero, one, and minus one. If I plug x equals 0 into this equation, I get alpha equals 0. If I plug x equals 1 into this equation, I get alpha plus 2 beta equals 0. And similarly, for minus 1, I get alpha minus 2, beta equal, uh, minus 2 plus beta equals 0. And when I try and solve this system of equations, well, the, this one ends up reading beta equals minus 2. This one is beta is equal to plus 2. That's a contradiction, there is no solution, and therefore the zero vector is not in S. And since it's not in S, S is not a subspace of the set of functions. The takeaway is, I'm given a set of vectors inside of a vector space, and I'm asked whether or not it is a subspace. Here's what I'll do in order. The very first thing I'll try is, can I write it as a span? Because if I can write it as a span, I'm done. If I can't write it as a span, if I don't see it, well, next thing I'll do is check whether or not the zero vector is inside of that set, because that excludes a lot of cases right there. If that passes, well, next thing is to see if I can come up with an easy counterexample. I won't spend much time on it. I'll just try and see if there's something obvious that lets me say, no, it's not a subspace. And if all of these fail, well, then I'll have to write out a foolproof, and I want you to use the template that I've provided above.